My name is Anna Elizabeth Rusch Frischnecht. I was born in St. Margrethe in Switzerland and spent my early childhood frolicking along the banks of the beautiful Rhine River. Because my father was a shoemaker, I ran many errands delivering shoes which I had polished. Once when I was coming home, I heard singing in the house. It was so beautiful that I thought it was the angels singing. It was the Mormon missionaries holding a meeting. That was the first time I ever heard Mormon missionaries. Since that time, I have loved the songs of Zion. My playmates, even my best friend, wouldn't play with me after we became Mormons. But Father had a strong testimony and soon said that he wanted to go to Utah for the sake of his children. Life for the new converts in Switzerland was difficult. The clergy and hoodlums did everything possible to make things miserable. Out of necessity, their church meetings were held in secret, and the preachers were forced to speak softly to avoid having their meetings broken up. Missionaries were thrown into jail, and even relatives turned against their own. When Father sold our home to leave for Utah, he remarked that he would have received more for it had it been a pile of manure. Although leaving their beautiful homeland forever was difficult, the Rouge family, along with thousands of other faithful European saints, willingly sacrificed all to gather to Zion. Of the approximately 30,000 people who had emigrated to Utah by 1860, about 3,000 or 10% had come by handcart. Though the percentage was small, the noble experiment of transporting poor saints across 1,300 miles of wilderness by inexpensive handcart looms large in Mormon history. And the image is enhanced and made even larger because of the tragedy suffered by two of the companies in 1856. The handcart story in Mormon history is, is long and pretty complicated, but there's one pretty good way of understanding it, and that is to take the ten companies that comprise the whole episode and divide them into three groups. So we start with the first three companies in 1856 who came through in, in pretty good shape. And then tragically we go to group number two, which are the fourth and fifth companies of the same year, 1856, and they suffered tragically and terribly in Wyoming snows. Then there's the third group, the last five, that came through in 1857 through 1860, and they came through in what was considered in those days a, a very good time and in very good condition. Another way of looking at this uh, handcart episode is to realize that the first seven companies jumped off from Iowa City, Iowa. And that was because in 1856, that's as far west as the railroad went. And so they had about 1,300 miles uh, to pull and push all of these things. However, by 1859, the railroad reached the Missouri River. And the hand carters could jump off from the Missouri River and shortened their journey to about a thousand and thirty two miles which certainly was a great benefit to the saints brigham young who originated the handcart experiment felt strongly about the lord's commandment to gather the faithful to zion therefore he established the perpetual emigration fund in eighteen forty nine which provided immediate funds for the saints to emigrate to utah 
Of course, they were expected to repay the funds as quickly as possible, and through this assistance, all of the saints had been brought out of Iowa by the end of 1852. Thereafter, the Perpetual Immigration Fund's money was directed toward assisting foreign immigrants by paying ship and railroad fares, and providing wagons and teams at the point of embarkation in Iowa. Despite such heroic efforts, however, only one out of 20 of those who wanted to emigrate were able to do so. To make matters worse, a grasshopper plague in 1855 deeply hurt Utah, which added greatly to the Perpetual Immigration Fund's financial difficulties. To ease that strain, Brigham Young wrote to Franklin D. Richards, the European mission president. We cannot afford to purchase wagons and teams as in times past. I am consequently thrown back upon my old plan to make handcarts and let the emigration foot it and draw upon them the necessary supplies, having a cow or two for every ten. They can come just as quick, if not quicker, and much cheaper. The great majority of them walk now. They will use handcarts in crossing the plains in which they will convey their provisions, tents, and necessary luggage. If the saints do not appreciate the wisdom of taking the smallest practicable amount of luggage, they will before they have hauled it far on the plains. It was estimated that using handcarts would reduce emigration costs by a third to a half for each person. Consequently, many more people could come to Zion through the available perpetual emigration funds. In October 1855, the First Presidency issued the 13th General Epistle advocating the handcart plan, and the enthusiastic response was immediate. William H. Kimball, on a mission in London, wrote, the fire of immigration blazes throughout the pastorate to such an extent that the folks are willing to part with all their effects and toddle off with a few things in a pocket handkerchief. Verily, there is power in Mormonism. And N.T. Porter wrote, As the season of immigration draws near, the appeals of the saints become more incessant for deliverance and many are begotten unto a lively hope by the introduction of handcarts as a cheaper mode of conveyance while they are waiting with ready hands to try the experiment. Finally, on April 5, 1856, the Millennial Star reported, the ship Enoch train cleared from Liverpool on Saturday for Boston with 534 saints on board, of whom 19 were from the Swiss, one from the Cape of Good Hope, and two from the East India missions. This is the first shipload of emigrants for Utah by the PE Fund this season, and it became the Lunt Handcart Company. This was followed by the S. Curling, a large ship that carried nearly 700 Mormons westward, the majority of them from Wales. They became the second handcart company. Though both voyages were stormy, they came safely to Boston. Once cleared through customs, the immigrants traveled westward from New York City by train through Chicago and Rock Island to Iowa City, where the railroad ended. The staging ground for the long trek westward was located three miles west of the rail terminal at present-day Colville, Iowa. It was here that the immigrants first saw their cumbersome handcarts, and this is where the story of the first three handcart companies began. Although different types of handcarts were used by the various companies, most handcarts had many characteristics in common. Josiah Rogerson, handcart pioneer, wrote, The open handcart is made of Iowa hickory or oak. The shafts and side pieces are the same material, but the axles generally of hickory. In length, the side pieces and shafts are about six or seven feet. Then two or three feet space from the latter bar to the front. 
the carts are the usual width of the wide track wagon. The axles are thimbleless with no metal ends and the cart carries 400 or 500 pounds of flour, bedding, clothing, cooking utensils and a tent. I do not know that it will ever hold up to the journey we are undertaking. The tents used by the handcart pioneers were round in shape and slept 20 people, which allowed no privacy and no protection from communicable disease. Since each cart was to carry the effects of five people, the companies were organized into hundreds, with 20 carts and five tents each. In theory, each company was also to have a few ox-drawn wagons carrying supplies and providing rides for the infirm. Because the carts moved faster than the wagons, however, the two rarely traveled together, and little benefit was derived by the weak and feeble. Each person was allowed 17 pounds of baggage, including clothing, bedding, and utensils. Mary Ann Jones of the first company wrote, When the brethren came to weigh our things, some wanted to take more than the allotted portion and put on extra clothes. Thus many who were real thin became suddenly stout. And as soon as the weighing was over, put their extra clothes back on the hand carts. But that did not last long. In a few days, we had to have all weighed again, and many were found with much more weight on the carts than allowed. One sister carried a teapot in a colander on her apron string all the way to Salt Lake. And another carried a hat box full of things, but she died on the way. Across Iowa, the handcarters followed reasonably good state and military roads via the communities of Amana, Marengo, Grinnell, Newton, Des Moines, and Redfield. From Lewis, they picked up the Pioneer Trail of 1846 to Council Bluffs, and finally to Florence, Nebraska. Once the companies were moving out of their staging ground, the emigrants quickly discovered the tedious, difficult nature of the journey. Though the carts were designed to be pulled by one or two people, it was soon obvious that everyone needed to help in either pushing or pulling, little children included. It was backbreaking, exhausting work, and to make their goal of 20 miles per day average was more than some could endure. Archer Walters, an English carpenter in the first company, wrote, June 11th, 1856, journeyed seven miles, very dusty, all tired and smothered with dust and camped in the dust or where the dust blowed, was captain over my tent of 18. June 15th, got up about four o'clock to make a coffin for my brother John Lee's son named William Lee, aged 12 years. Meetings as usual, and at the same time had to make another coffin for Sister Prater's child. Was tired with repairing handcarts the last week. And so it went day after weary day. On the 26th he wrote, Traveled about one mile. Very faint from lack of food. We're only allowed about three quarters of a pound of flour a head each day. And about three ounces of sugar and half pound of bacon each week. Which makes those that have no money very weak. My children cry with hunger and it grieves me and makes me cross. Made a child's coffin for a sister Sheen. Emma Sheen, aged two and a half years. Chris Birmingham, who traveled with the second company, recorded, This day, 
Brother Arthur stopped at town, himself and his family, as he could not draw his hand cart any further. July 3rd, started at 5 o'clock and camped at 7.15 p.m. after a long and tedious journey of 25 miles. Some of the brethren fainted on the road and were carried into camp in the ox team. I nearly fainted myself from exhaustion, but plucked up my courage and never let go of the hand cart. Seventh. After ten miles, two families gave out, being frightened at getting nothing for three days but Indian corn stirred about. They stopped at a farmhouse to work for two dollars per day and food. Of these dropouts, J. H. Lady commented, These are those who are apt to forget the God who has delivered them from their gentile chains and taskmasters and are allured by fine promises and high wages. Others there are whose faith is not of that nature to stand the trials they are called upon to undergo and back out from five to fifty in a company of three hundred. J.D.T. McAllister, a return missionary from England who served in Iowa City dispersing supplies, wrote what came to be called the handcart song to cheer the weary travelers as they trudged along. Ye saints that dwell on Europe's shore, prepare yourselves with many more to leave behind your names in land for sure God's judgments are at hand. For you must cross the raging main Before the promised land you gain And with the faithful men the start To cross the plains with your hand hard For some must push and some must pull And see the marching up the hill So merry on the way we go Until we reach the valley home and maidens there will dance and sing, young men more happy than a king. And children too will laugh and play, their strength increasing day by day. For some must push and some must pull, and we go on. By late July, all three companies were in Nebraska Territory, moving from the prairies out onto the Great Plains. From the Missouri River, all the handcart companies followed the well-worn pioneer trail of 1847 into the valley of the Great Salt Lake. As the handcart pioneers trudged across the treeless plains of western Nebraska, the women and children left the carts to gather buffalo chips to feed the fires for cooking their meals. Mary Ann Jones wrote, Some may recoil at the thought of a supper cooked in water dug from a buffalo wallow and with buffalo chips, but it tasted good to us, and the chips were plentiful. We once came across an immense herd of buffalo, and it looked as if the whole prairie was moving. We waited more than an hour for them to cross the road before we could go on. Unfortunately, Nebraska weather can change quickly and become violent. After crossing the Elkhorn Ferry at Loop Fork on July 26, 1856, Archer Walters wrote, as soon as we crossed, it looked very dark and black. We had not got far and it began to light. Soon the thunder roared and about the middle of the train of hand carts, the lightning struck a brother and he fell to rise no more in that body. Priscilla M. Evans of the Third Company wrote, At first we had a little coffee and bacon, but that was soon gone and we had no need for any cooking utensils but a frying pan. 
We had no grease for the wheels on the handcarts. And one day, they killed an old buffalo. And my husband and John Thane, a butcher, sat up all night to boil some to get grease to grease the handcarts. But it was so old and tough, there was not a speck of grease in it. There were other frustrations as well. Eleanor Roberts, a Welsh girl, was always very proud and particular about her shoes, always keeping them shiny and clean. When they reached the Missouri River, she took them off and set them on the bank of the river. When she got to the other side, she discovered she had left them. She walked the rest of the journey barefooted. By mid to late August, the majority of the first three companies were in present Wyoming, and the most difficult part of the trek commenced. Across the greater part of Wyoming, the Mormon Trail closely followed the older Oregon Trail. Yet the Lord blessed the people, and miracles were reported on a regular basis. For instance, Twist Birmingham wrote, this morning, an old woman belonging to our company was bitten by a rat snake in the leg. And before half an hour, her leg swelled to four times its thickness. She was administered to by the elders, and we started again. But unfortunately, as we were starting, another old woman was run over by one of the wagons. Miraculously, although the wagon was loaded with 3,200 pounds of flour, not one of her bones was broken. But despite harsh travel conditions and circumstances, the first three companies did have some pleasant moments. While some in Iowa ridiculed them, others were kind and helpful. Some gave the saints needed food, and one kind soul in Des Moines donated 15 pairs of children's shoes. Along the trail, there was romance and marriage. Some couples married at the staging ground near Iowa City, some on the Missouri River, and some later on in Utah. Boys went swimming, and often there was music and singing around the campfires. The first company even had their own Birmingham band. The hand carters met lots of Indians as they were crossing and going west. And, and they were fascinated by Indians and interested in them, and they found the Indians friendly. Uh, they met all kinds of Indians. In fact, uh, the hand quarters were much more likely to be helped by Indians than hurt by them. Uh, the Indians traded with them. The Indians gave them direction. Sometimes the Indians gave them food. Sometimes the Indians uh, rescued uh, the, the lost and the stragglers. And sometimes they entertained the pioneers by something they called uh, singing and archery exhibits and horse races. So it, it was a two-way street and uh, we got along pretty well with the Indians. Now, the first three companies of 1856 uh, reached the valley safely in uh, late September and early October. And collectively, they had only suffered about 25 deaths, uh, which is a death rate of about 3%. And in those days, that was a very low death rate. The euphoria, the great joy of the success of the third, first three companies was very uh, short-lived because the fourth company and the fifth company, uh, known as the Willies and the Morton companies, ran into stark tragedy in Wyoming blizzards. And the fate of these two companies was the single greatest disaster in all of the history of the westward movement in this country. The difficulties started even before they left England. The emigrants from Scotland, England, Wales, and Scandinavia, 764 of whom sailed on the Thornton and 856 on the ship Horizon, were unduly late in leaving. Thus, they did not even arrive in Iowa City until June 26th and July 8th, respectively.
Worse, the groups were much larger than expected, and Mormon church agents at Iowa City had to work frantically to get handcarts, wagons, and other supplies gathered together so the emigrants could be on their way. It was July 15th before the season's fourth company, under the direction of James G. Willie, finally left Iowa City, and July 28th when the fifth company, under the leadership of Edward Martin, pulled out. Willie's company was comprised of 500 persons, 120 handcarts, and five supply wagons. Martin's party consisted of 576 people, with 146 carts and seven supply wagons. Behind them traveled two ox trains led by Captains W.B. Hodgett and John A. Hunt, although in reality they offered little assistance to the handcart companies because of their slow speed. Several carts in Willie's company were drawn by young girls exclusively with no male companions, and two tents were occupied by them. The 277-mile journey to winter quarters was made in a little less than four weeks. Willie's company reached there August 11th and Martin's on the 22nd. Here, each company was delayed for repairs. J.H. Lady wrote, The companies stay here longer than they otherwise would in consequence of their carts being unfit for their journey across the plains. The whole of them having a piece of iron screwed on to prevent the wheel from wearing away the wood. Unfortunately, since the carts had been manufactured of green wood that was still warping and shrinking, even the precaution of iron on the wheels would prove to be insufficient. In Florence, or winter quarters, a lively debate ensued among the leaders about the advisability of continuing west at such a late season, but there was no consensus. Therefore, a general meeting of all the immigrants was called to consult with them about it. Being entirely ignorant of the country and the climate, and being simple, honest, and eager to go to Zion at once, the people in general wanted to do as their leaders directed. And with only one exception, all of the leaders encouraged the saints to go on. That one exception was Levi Savage, who stated that the companies could not cross the mountains with a mixed group of aged people, women, and little children so late in the season without much suffering, sickness, and death. He therefore advised going into winter quarters without delay. He was voted down. Nevertheless, he said, Brothers and sisters, what I have said I know to be true. But seeing you are to go forward, I will go with you. Will help you all I can. I will work with you. I will suffer with you, and if necessary, I will die with you. May God in his mercy bless and preserve us. Yet the emigrants would not be dissuaded. President Franklin D. Richards, returning from presiding over the European mission, observed that they were in good spirits and full of confidence that they should reach the mountains in season to escape the severe storms. I have never seen more union among the saints anywhere than is manifest in the handcart companies. The fourth, or Willie Company, started west from winter quarters about the 18th of August, and all was the same except that each cart carried an extra hundred pounds of flour. A few grumbled at this, but most were filled with mirth and happiness as the days fled behind them. Levi Savage's warning was forgotten, and each evening the camp rang with the sound of laughter. The only difficulty encountered was with the carts, which were constantly breaking down and causing delays. John Chislett of the Willie Company wrote, 
Of anything suitable for this purpose, we had nothing at all. The poor folks had to use their bacon to grease their axles, and some even used their soap, of which they had very little. Then, near present-day Grand Island, Nebraska, a herd of buffalo stampeded the company's cattle and oxen one night. For three days, the emigrants gathered what strays they could find. John Chislett added, But we had only enough oxen left to put one yoke to each supply wagon. But as they were loaded with about 3,000 pounds of flour, the teams could not, of course, move them. We then yoked up our beef cattle, milk cows, and in fact everything that could bear a yoke, even two-year-old heifers. The stock was wild and could pull but a little, and we were still unable to move our loads. As a last resort, we loaded more sacks of flour on each cart. It was really hard for the folks to lose the use of their milk cows, have beef rations stopped, and haul 100 pounds more on their carts. On September 1st, when the company arrived at Fort Laramie in what would later be Wyoming, they found their expected supplies and provisions were not available, and they were forced to cut rations to three quarters of a pound of flour per day. Shortly thereafter, they received a letter from the Salt Lake Valley informing them that they would get no supplies before South Pass, some 200 miles to the west. Captain Willie was forced to reduce rations even further to 10 ounces of flour per day. Later, as they started along the Sweetwater River, the nights turned severely cold, and the distant mountains were covered with the season's first layer of snow. John Chislett reported, Our 17 pounds of clothing and bedding was now altogether insufficient for our comfort. Nearly all suffered more or less at night from cold. Instead of getting up in the morning strong, refreshed, and prepared for the hardships of another day of toil, the poor saints were to be seen crawling out from their tents, haggard, benumbed, and showing an utter lack of that vitality so necessary to our success. Soon our old and infirm began to droop, and they no sooner lost spirit and courage than death's stamp could be traced upon their features. At first the deaths occurred slowly, but in a few days at more regular intervals, until soon we thought it unusual to leave a campground without burying one or more persons. Finally, we were overtaken by a snowstorm, which the shrill wind blew furiously about us. The snow fell several inches deep as we traveled along, but we dared not stop for we had a 16-mile journey to make, and short of it, we could not get wood and water. Meanwhile, the 5th, or Martin Company, didn't reach Fort Laramie until October 8th. Of that time, Elizabeth Jackson, a member of that company, recorded, Our provisions by this time had become very scant, and many of the company went to the fort and sold their watches and jewelry for provisions. Give you uh, one sack of flour. That be okay? Yes, I think I can do that. Shortly after leaving Fort Laramie, rations were cut and then cut again until each person was getting less than half a pound of flour per day. Now and then some stringy beef and nothing else but water. Still, only those few with previous experience crossing the Rockies knew enough to really worry. On October 19th, a terribly cold day, the company reached the Red Butte crossing of the Platte, near present-day Casper, Wyoming. The river was wide, the water exceedingly cold. Of that crossing, Josiah Rogerson wrote that it was fraught with more fatalities than any other incident of the entire journey. Blocks of mushy snow and ice had to be dodged. The result of wading the stream by the female members was immediately followed by partial and temporary dementia, from which several did not recover until the next spring. 
the immigrants had scarcely crossed the Platte River when they were visited with a tremendous storm of snow, hail, sand, and fierce winds. Unfortunately, two days earlier, the exhausted company had reduced baggage to 10 pounds per adult. Discarding blankets and other bedding, extra clothing and so forth. Now, with the bitter cold and fierce storms, and with more than 400 miles of winter travel stretching ahead of them, the saints needed those things desperately. But they were not to be had. About 12 miles beyond the crossing of the Platte, the exhausted company became snowbound. And there they remained, dying at the rate of several a day as they waited for help. Meanwhile, on October 4th, President Franklin D. Richards and his party of returning missionaries had reached Salt Lake City, and it was not until then that Brigham Young and the Saints learned that there were still immigrants out on the plains. As soon as returning missionaries got word to Brigham Young in Salt Lake City of the pending tragedy that a thousand members were stuck back in the snow in Wyoming in characteristic fashion, he had rescue teams on the way the next day. About 16 teams went, went out early, and after that, as fast as possible, there were actually ended up to be over 100, around 104 teams formed the various rescue parties that uh, came back here to save their brothers and sisters. And the, and the little ones and everything they could. Many men, including the missionaries who had just returned, volunteered to set out at once with aid. Others, such as Daniel W. Jones, an experienced scout, were called by the brethren. And still others, like Harvey H. Clough, volunteered because they had relatives in one of the handcart companies. Then there was Ephraim K. Hanks, who on his way home from fishing on Utah Lake, received revelation that the handcart companies were in trouble. Two days later, when a call was made by Brigham Young in conference, Ephraim volunteered and immediately set out all alone in a light wagon. The response from the Mormon church, only nine years removed from the stark desert it had conquered with worn out wagons and bare hands, was magnificent. By October 7th, wagon loads of food and supplies, led by 27 healthy young men, were headed eastward with the first installment of provisions. And the members at home were vigorously gathering more to follow, until by the end of October, 250 teams were on the road to bring relief. The lead company, led by George D. Grant and Robert T. Burton, fully expected to find Captain Willie's company in the vicinity of Green River, two days beyond Fort Bridger. On the sixth day, the rescuers reached the fort and found no sign of the handcarters. Pushing on, the next day they encountered some of their own front-running wagons already returning. Their drivers convinced that the immigrants had gone into winter camp at Fort Laramie or some other such place. However, Grant immediately turned them around and all continued their search eastward. Captain Grant also dispatched a four-man express with fast horses and a light wagon to go ahead and find the immigrants and let them know that help was on the way. For three days, storms raged past left and right of the Grant Company, but that company pushed on and by October 17th they had crossed South Pass and then the full fury of that blizzard hit them head on and stopped them pretty much dead in their tracks just like it had stopped the Willys and Martin Handcart Company. So Grant cashed a lot of supplies and left some men and went ahead with a smaller rescue party. And on Willow Creek the next day, October 18th, he was stopped again, and there was nothing to do except just wait the storm out. At the Willie camp on Rock Creek, all was forlorn desperation. 18-year-old Sarah James wrote, We were cold all the time. There was either rain or snow or wind. Even when you wrapped up in a blanket, your teeth chattered.
Finally, the four-man express sent out by Captain Grant found Willie's company. Daniel Jones wrote, On arriving, we found them in a condition that would stir the feelings of the hardest heart. They were in a poor place, a storm having caught them where fuel was scarce. They were out of provisions and really freezing and starving to death. We did all we could to relieve them. The boys struck out on horseback and dragged up a lot of wood. Provisions were distributed and all went to work to cheer the sufferers. The morning after our arrival, nine were buried in one grave. It's impossible to be here on the Mormon Trail, here in the location where the Willie Handcart Company was rescued, or in Martin Cove where the Martin Handcart Company was rescued, without thinking of the suffering that these people went through and the dying that occurred. The Willie Company faced two feet of snow on the level. Someone said, what a terrible place to camp with all of the thistles here. But they would have paid little attention to those thistles. They wouldn't even have been aware of them because they had two feet of snow to plow through to pitch a tent. Uh, in order to just get some shelter, the wind, while they were here, never stopped blowing. The snow fell most of the time. Uh, snow would be drifting over these rocks and coming in and piling in huge drifts on them here in this little river bottom. So they would be facing all kinds of adversity from the weather. Some of the immigrants experienced great joy at the sudden appearance of the men, while others were so far gone as to have little interest in them. Unfortunately, the Express had little to offer besides hope and a miserably small amount of flour, for three of them still had to press forward to find Martin's company. William Kimball remained with the Willie Company, and under his encouragement, the immigrants somehow roused themselves and renewed their journey, going 16 miles the first day in spite of their weakened and hungry condition. During the entire rescue effort of the Willie Company, resources would prove sufficient to keep the hardy alive, but never enough to reduce the suffering significantly. For 20 men to help 440 was nearly impossible, though they did what they could. The sickest could ride part of the way, and many could sleep in wagons at night, with bedding enough not to keep them warm, but to keep their flesh from crystallizing. Nevertheless, each morning, three or four people would be found dead in their blankets. On the second day under William Kimball's command, the most terrible ordeal of the entire journey of the Willie Company occurred. The five-mile-long ascent of Rocky Ridge during a howling snowstorm. The snow was knee-deep. The wind whipped snow onto the exhausted immigrants. Sarah James, dizzy and sleepy a lot of the time, nevertheless pulled the family cart along with her sister, occasionally getting a little help from the men from the Salt Lake Valley. At one point, she watched a man just ahead of her lie down in his shafts and start to cry. Sarah wrote, We all wanted to cry with him. One of the captains came up to him and just slapped him in the face. That made the man so mad that he jumped right up and started to run with his cart. I remember that it was a mean way to treat the poor fellow, but I recognize now that it saved his life. By prayer, perseverance, and the timely arrival of supply wagons from Salt Lake City, William Kimball led the Willie Company into the Salt Lake Valley, where they arrived November 9th, having suffered 67 deaths. Meanwhile, the remaining three men of the Express pressed on to Devil's Gate. Still not finding Martin's company, they waited there for Captain Grant and the rest of the rescuers to arrive. And at the Martin and Hodgett camp, near the Red Butte crossing of the Platte River, the situation was just as grim. John Bond, a 12-year-old boy, wrote, Day after day passes, and still, no tidings of help coming from the westward. The bugle is sounded each day by John Watkins to call the saints together for prayers. 
to ask the Infinite Father to bring food, medicines, and other things necessary for the sick and the needy. After prayers, all are ordered to bed. In the morning, we discover more deaths. Some are lying side by side with hands entwined. In other cases, they are found as if they had just offered a fervent prayer, and their spirit had taken flight while in the act. Some die sitting by the fire, and some are singing hymns or eating crusts of bread. Daniel Jones of the Rescue Party recorded, Having seen the sufferings of Brother Willie's company, we more fully realized the danger the others were in. We decided to make camp at Devil's Gate and send on another express to find where the people were, and not return until they were found. Joseph A. Young, along with myself and Abe Gar, were selected. On the second day, after riding about 12 miles, we saw a white man's shoe track on the road. Brother so Young called out, here they are. We put our animals to their utmost speed and soon came in sight of the camp at Red Bluff Butte. In camp, young John Bond saw Sister Scott looking into the west. All at once she sprang to her feet and screamed at the top of her voice. I see them coming! I see them coming! Surely they are angels from heaven. This company was in almost as bad a condition as the first one. They had nearly given up hope. Daniel Jones continued, Many declared we were angels from heaven. Brother Young told the people to gather up and move on at once, because the only salvation was to travel a little every day was right, and no doubt saved many lives, for we, among so many, could do but little. There was danger of more starvation before help could arrive unless the people made some headway toward the valley. A condition of distress here met my eyes that I never saw before or since. The train was strung out for three or four miles. There were old men pulling and tugging their carts, sometimes loaded with a sick wife or children. Women pulling along sick husbands, little children six to eight years old struggling through the mud and the snow. As night came on, the mud would freeze on their clothes and feet. There were two of us and hundreds needing help. Several died that night. The next morning, Brother Young having come up, we three started for our camp at Devil's Gate, 65 miles away. The following morning, most of the company moved down, meeting the handcart company at Greasewood Creek. Such assistance as we could give was rendered to all until they finally arrived at Devil's Gate Fort about the 1st of November. John Jacques, a member of the Martin Company, wrote, There was a foot or 18 inches of snow on the ground, which as there was only one or two spades in camp, the immigrants had to shovel away with their frying pans or tin plates or anything else they could use for that purpose before they could pitch their tents. And then the ground was so frozen so hard, that it was almost impossible to drive tent pegs into it. Some of the men were so weak that it took them an hour or two to clear the places for their tents and set them up. On November 2nd, Captain Grant sent a small express led by Joseph Young to the Salt Lake Valley to let Brigham Young know the true condition of the immigrants, over a third of whom were unable to even walk. With the express gone, Captain Grant called a meeting of the rescuers and stranded company to decide if wintering in the few small cabins at Devil's Gate Fort would actually save lives. But with so many needing medical attention, they decided to press on as soon as the weather broke. 
Until then, the freezing company crossed the Sweetwater to shelter in a cove, which offered more protection from the elements. Forever afterwards, the place was known as Martin's Cove. The crossing of the Sweetwater seemed impossible for most of the immigrants. The river, though not more than two or three feet deep at Devil's Gate, was 90 to 120 feet across. Ice caked the banks and clogged the water. One of the immigrants, Patience Loader, stated that when she saw the river, she could not keep her tears back. Eliza Cussworth Burton, a young widow with two small children, was forced to wade back and forth across the sweet water three times. First, she took her seven-year-old son Joseph across on her back. She told him to stay on the other side while she went for his sister, Martha. However, Joseph became frightened and began to follow his mother back. So Eliza was forced to tie him to a tree with her apron strings while she went back for her four-year-old daughter, Martha Ann. Once Martha was safely on the other side with Joseph, Eliza crossed the river again to get their cart. Few emigrants, however, actually pulled their own carts across the river. Members of the rescue party spent the day in the water, pulling carts and carrying people over. At least three of them were affected throughout their much shortened lives by this act of heroism. And Brigham Young declared that their sacrifice had ensured for them their exaltation in the celestial kingdom. This is the famous Martin's Cove. We're here in the snowstorm, as you can see. We're here for a very special reason. This area here, the Sweetwater River over there, is a famous site in one of the most famous and tragic episodes of the entire Mormon westward movement from Nauvoo, Illinois to Salt Lake City, Utah, between 1846 and 1868. Two companies, the Morton's Company here and the Willie's Company some 70 miles west of here on Rock Creek. This blizzard stopped them dead in their tracks. They were sick, they were freezing, they were malnourished, they were suffering from exposure, and they were trapped, in a word. They chewed bark. Uh, they tried to chew uh, dead leaves when there was nothing else. Uh, sometimes they would uh, take the leather parts of their actual carts and try and chew and boil and roast and eat them. A and then sometimes they would take the very shoes off the corpses and somehow manage to stay alive eating that. But there's one story that just rips my heart out anyway, and that's the poor mother and her children with absolutely nothing to eat. So the poor thing, she found a few flour sacks, she ripped them apart, put them down on the ground, and asked her children, this is it, suck all the flour you can out of the seams of these flour sacks. Now you talk suffering, uh, that's, that's pretty much up to the top. For five days, the Martin Company remained in the cove, waiting for additional supplies and help which never came, and for the weather to improve. Finally, on Sunday, November 9th, with the weather clear and warmer, the handcart emigrants moved out. Having stashed most of their effects at the Devil's Gate stockade, many handcarts could now be left behind. Still, only the very weakest were permitted to ride in the wagons. Heber McBride, a member of the Martin Company, wrote, My sister and me would see Mother and Peter and Maggie fixed in the wagon. Then Ether, Janetta, and me would walk along with the others. A great many froze their toes and feet. The march continued. 
under conditions so bad that many others now gave up and died, dropping in their tracks or slumping over their broth by the campfire, their hearts stopping at night in their tents. By journey's end, this would be the fate of between 150 and 167 of the Martin Company, one-fourth of its members. The usual worst-case mortality rate of wagon trains was one in 20. And then, as another blizzard raked the struggling party on November 11th, Ephraim Hanks finally appeared out of the storm. For a month, he had battled his solitary way across the mountains, encountering indifferent mountain men, hostile Indians, and continual storms. Three days before, he had prayed for and then shot a buffalo, which meat he was bringing to the hungry immigrants. Ephraim recorded, I think the sun was about an hour high in the west when I spied something in the distance that looked like a black streak in the snow. As I got near to it, I perceived it moved. Then I was satisfied that this was the long-looked-for Hancock Company. That night, Ephraim went about the camp nursing the sick and the dying. Yet in spite of his efforts and the efforts of others, many immigrants lost limbs. Ephraim added, Many such I washed with water and Castile soap until the frozen parts would fall off. After which, I would sever the shreds of flesh from the remaining portion to the limbs with my scissors. Some of the immigrants lost toes, others fingers, and others whole hands and feet. And quite a number who survived became cripples for life. In the eyes of many of the sufferers, Hanks became a hero. But he also brought bad news, reporting that many of the rescue wagons had turned back, their drivers convinced that the immigrants had perished in the snow. Nor could they be blamed, for there were places along the trail where the drifts rose above the wagon bows. Many of the rescuers were severely frostbitten before many days had passed on their journey east. Captain Grant knew that his two-man express would straighten things out. But just to be sure, he sent another express to South Pass to bring on whatever provisions were available. Finally, on November 16th, Martin's company was cheered by 10 wagons of supplies from the Salt Lake Valley. And two days later, more teams from the valley arrived. On November 19th, all the Martin Company emigrants were finally riding in wagons and were tucked securely under wagon covers so that they crossed South Pass in safety. They met more supplies on the Green River and arrived at Fort Bridger on the 23rd. On November 25th, they arrived at Bear River near modern-day Evanston, Wyoming. And a few days after that, they crossed Big Mountain. Finally, on November 30th, the immigrants in 104 relief wagons descended into Salt Lake Valley. The death count of the Willie and Martin companies was well over 200, and for those who still lived, the suffering was not yet over, and for many it would continue for life. But that wonderful day of deliverance would never be forgotten. The Donner Party, caught in the snows of the Sierra Nevadas just 10 years before, saw 40 die in a company of 87. John C. Fremont, in the blizzards of the San Juan Mountains of Colorado in 1849, lost 10 of his 33 men. While their proportion of losses in these two companies is greater, the number of deaths in the Mormon caravans was much higher. Some people might think that the tragedy of the handcart companies is less important than the sufferings of other people because they bore it uh, rather meekly, stoically, they had faith, they had perseverance, and they were not reduced, as other parties were, to cannibals, just to stay alive. It did happen. It happened with the Fremont Party. It happened with the Donner Party. But if endurance and courage 
and faithfulness and love and compassion. Now, if that counts for anything, most assuredly, this was one of the great successes of the whole westward movement. Of course, these tragedies turned later emigrants against handcart travel to allay their fears and to demonstrate that handcarts were a good idea. The general authorities sent 70 missionaries east in 1857, drawing all their belongings in handcarts. It took the men 48 days to make the journey to winter quarters, including seven and a half days of resting and repairing carts. And all of them declared themselves to be fit as fiddles and ready to wrestle any man in Florence. Because of the success of this Mormon missionary company, the fears of going by handcart abated, and five more companies, the 6th through the 10th, eventually went west in this manner between the years of 1857 and 1860. These last five companies had it much easier than the earlier ones. Travel was more routine. There were more bridges, trailside services, ferries, provision stations where supplies awaited the immigrants, and little trouble with Indians. During 1857, the 6th and 7th companies entered the valley successfully, having suffered much from hunger, but together only about a dozen deaths. The threat of war with Johnston's army stopped all immigration in 1858. But in 1859, another company of Europeans made their way across the plains drawing handcarts. This eighth company was unique in that it was the first immigrant company to go all the way to the Missouri River by train. They arrived by the Hannibal and in St. Joseph, Missouri, took a riverboat upstream to Florence and proceeded west by handcart, lessening their trek by some 275 miles. By now, the dangers and suffering of the trip were greatly reduced. The worst this company had to endure was hunger because supply trains from the west were slow in intercepting the immigrants. They arrived generally healthy September 4th with only five deaths and like most other companies, were escorted into the valley. The last of the handcart emigrants, the 9th and 10th companies, made the journey west in 1860. The 9th Company endured much hunger, but put their trust in the Lord, enjoyed music and dancing, had no trouble with Indians, and lost only one emigrant to death. The 10th and last company arrived about one month after the 9th company on September 24, 1860, without losing a single immigrant. The happiness of this company when they first saw their new home from the summit of Big Mountain is perhaps typical of what most hand carters felt. They shouted for joy, tossed their hats, and gave thanks to God for helping them safely over the plains and mountains to Zion. By 1861, they had learned it was possible to go out and back in one season. They therefore sent Teamsters to meet the emigrants in Florence, Nebraska, and carry them westward, eliminating the need for either carts or expensive locally purchased wagons and teams. The Mormon Teamsters also carried freight west from the Missouri, so double good was accomplished. Thus ended this unique and noble experience, an experiment in transporting 3,000 saints from Europe to the new homes in Promised Valley, tops of the mountains, where they made the desert blossom as the rose. He remarked that he would have received more for it had it been a pile of manure. A 
Although leaving their beautiful homeland forever was difficult, the Rouge family, along with thousands of other faithful European saints, willingly sacrificed all to gather to Zion. Of the approximately 30,000 people who had emigrated to Utah by 1860, about 3,000 or 10% had come by handcart. Though the percentage was small, the noble experiment of transporting poor saints across 1,300 miles of wilderness by inexpensive handcart looms large in Mormon history. And the image is enhanced and made even larger because of the tragedy suffered by two of the companies in 1856. The handcart story in Mormon history is, is long and pretty complicated, but there's one pretty good way of understanding it, and that is to take the ten companies that comprise the whole episode and divide them into three groups. Delivering shoes which I had polished. Once when I was coming home, I heard singing in the house. It was so beautiful that I thought it was the angels singing. It was the Mormon missionaries holding a meeting. That was the first time I ever heard Mormon missionaries. Since that time, I have loved the songs of Zion. My playmates, even my best friend, wouldn't play with me after we became Mormons. But Father had a strong testimony and soon said that he wanted to go to Utah for the sake of his children. Life for the new converts in Switzerland was difficult. The clergy and hoodlums did everything possible to make things miserable. Out of necessity, their church meetings were held in secret, and the preachers were forced to speak softly to avoid having their meetings broken up. Missionaries were thrown into jail, and even relatives turned against their own. When father sold our home to leave for Utah, so we start with the first three companies in 1856 who came through in, in pretty good shape. And then tragically we go to group number two, which are the fourth and fifth companies of the same year, 1856, and they suffered tragically and terribly in Wyoming snows. Then there's the third group, the last five, that came through in 1857 through 1860. And they came through in what was considered in those days a, a very good time and in very good condition. Another way of looking at this uh, handcart episode is to realize that the first seven companies jumped off from Iowa City, Iowa. And that was because in 1856 that's as far west as the railroad went. And so they had about 1,300 miles to, to pull and push all of these things. However, by 1859, the railroad reached the Missouri River, and the hand carters could jump off from the Missouri River and shorten their journey to about 1,032 miles, which certainly was a great benefit to the saints. Brigham Young, who originated the handcart experiment, felt strongly about the Lord's commandment to gather the faithful to Zion. Therefore, he established the Perpetual Emigration Fund in 1849, which provided immediate funds for the saints to emigrate to Utah. Of course, they were expected to repay the funds as quickly as possible, and through this assistance, all of the saints had been brought out of Iowa by the end of 1852. Thereafter, the Perpetual Immigration Fund's money was directed toward assisting foreign immigrants by paying ship and railroad fares and providing wagons and teams at the point of embarkation in Iowa. Despite such heroic efforts, however, only one out of 20 of those who wanted to emigrate were able to do so. 
To make matters worse, a grasshopper plague in 1855 deeply hurt Utah, which added greatly to the Perpetual Immigration Fund's financial difficulties. To ease that strain, Brigham Young wrote to Franklin D. Richards, the European mission president. We cannot afford to purchase wagons and teams as in times past. I am consequently thrown back upon my old plan to make handcarts and let the emigration foot it and draw upon them the necessary supplies, having a cow or two for every ten. I was born in St. Margrethe in Switzerland and spent my early childhood frolicking along the banks of the beautiful Rhine River. Because my father was a shoemaker, I ran many errands 